Good afternoon, everyone. So, on the first note, I would like to welcome Professor Shobana Chadia, who is a distinguished research professor and also associate dean, and also a Fulbright Nehru Fellow 2022 of uh, North University of Texas. And he's the director of Corsa, uh, which ma'am will talk about what is Corsa later. And today we are fortunate to have him because I think as uh, with the director of discussing, maybe it is the first collaboration with one of the private colleagues in Nagaland or maybe even in India. So we're very fortunate to have ma'am. To, and we also look forward for long-term collaboration and also to discuss how we can work together uh, on uh, the languages and also the technology that we can develop for the other resource languages. So we're very fortunate. And today she will be speaking on the topic yes. given here, the importance of language documentation and funding opportunities for endangered languages. So uh, please feel free to interact after her talk and at the end we'll more have like more informal conversation. So please, please, please feel free. That's what I want to say. So uh, thank you everyone who are here also. And I look forward and we look forward to have a wonderful time. Yeah, thank you. So I, before I give time to uh, Professor um, Shobana, I would like to welcome our director to kindly give her a small token as we have evidence for her. So I appreciate it. Thank you. So with that, I give time to men. Yeah, please. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much for the warm invitation to come and speak to this college. It looks like a wonderful place to study. I saw all the people as we were driving in, and I said to Dr. Michael, everyone looks so young. <laughs> but it's, uh, it, it makes me feel so happy to see you all here studying and seeing all the opportunities ahead for you. And I hope that today's talk can inspire you in some way for, for that future of what, what you're planning and your studies. So I am originally from South India, but I have been working for uh, many years in the US, almost 30 years in the US. But I come back every year, and as I've been coming back as a linguist, I've noticed that there's been a need. I'm trying to get to this presentation mode here. Um, oopsie, I think I did something. Maybe it'll take a few minutes. Uh, the, the, I noticed that there was a need here in, in all the people that I've talked to, the linguists and the students, that as they were working in their linguistic worlds, they were not feeling like their work was being seen enough. And they were also publishing things that very often ended up on a bookshelf somewhere and people were not using it. And I felt like there was such good work being done, there should be a way to shout out that that work was being done and bring it to the world and also increase the usability of that material. So when a few years ago, about, um, about maybe about five, six years ago, I started talking to my library at the University of North Texas where I work about creating a digital archive for the languages of South Asia so that linguists and even people who are not linguists if they're interested in things that have to do with language, could bring their materials and deposit them with us, and we would find a way to tell the rest of the world that it was there and it was important and how could it be used. So the reuse, the access, and also very importantly, preservation. So that's what Corsal is about, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, why do something like that. What's the importance of documenting a language? And many of you speak a language which is not written or read very often. There may be a Bible, there may be hymnals, but there probably isn't a newspaper, for example, or storybooks. And so what would be important about the archive? Could it contribute to creating a, a more of a literature in your language? So all of these things we will want to discuss today. So let me, let me get started with that. And that's, this is what, I wrote a book about this recently, and you can Google Springer why language documentation matters. It's a very small, like uh, a 90 page book. If you're interested in, I can give you the PDF if your students want to you know, look at it. It goes through and talks about the various um, community and linguist cooperation that has made some of the 
studies of language possible in North America, in Australia, and also in Northeast India. So you would be interested, I think, in those case studies, the book of case studies. Um, and there, uh, I start out with this very kind of traditional definition of what is language documentation. Uh, when you say language documentation to somebody, they have no idea what it means. So linguistics is a, is a very vast field because it talks about all the different aspects of language. So you talk phonetics today. You also talk about language change, the history of English. So phonetics and history of English, that kind of thing, historical linguistics, that's one part of it. Um, and then there's like studying how the sentences work. There's also studying the politics of language. But for all of that, we need to know something about the language to start with. And for many of our languages in Northeast India, there's hardly anything that's been written about them. So if you think about your own language, the language that you speak natively, uh, your home language, think about what's been written about that language in terms of, is there a dictionary? Is there a grammar? Is there some digital availability? Can you Google with that language? For, for I work with on the language Meteron, which is spoken in Manipur uh, state, almost 1.23 million speakers. You cannot have, uh, you can't Google with it. I think they have uh, beginnings of a Google bar, but it's not, uh, you don't have voice recognition. There's so many things that you have for English and German not available for our languages. So language documentation is the thing which creates the resource, the basic resource that allows us to have all of these new things that the world has for English and so all the new digital uh, kind of goodies that the world has for the big languages. Language documentation creates a lasting record of a language that has few digital resources. So the lasting record part of it is very important. Language documentation is not just like writing down a little bit about a language and then putting it in your CV, but you want to make it something that'll be preserved forever so that you can use it later on, I can use it later on, and many generations from now can use it later on. There's a, a case study that I discuss in that book of uh, somebody who spoke the Miamia language, his family spoke it. Um, he's actually a McCarthy Genius winner award of that, um, won one of the McCarthy Genius Awards. His name is Baldwin, I'm forgetting his first name right now. Daryl, Daryl Baldwin. And Daryl Baldwin's family spoke Miamia, his grandparents did. But by the time it came to his parents, no one spoke the language anymore. In the old days, we would call that an extinct language or a dead language. We don't say that anymore. We call them sleeping languages. The reason, a lot of it has to do with Daryl Baldwin and his family. Daryl Baldwin decided that he wanted to learn his language and he was very sad that it was no longer uh, available. So he went to an archive. He went to the National Archive in the US, and he looked for the lasting record of that language. And he learned about that language with the help of a linguist. And then he taught, he spoke only in that language to his kids. His wife was white. She was not Miamia, but they only spoke in Miamia together. And they created the next generation of first language speakers of Miami. So the sleeping language where the connection with ancestors was lost was then revived through this lasting record. So a lasting record is very important for, for that kind of also revival and preservation of our culture. So um, that's the second part of it. Digital language reports study, support linguistic study, but also revitalization of, of language. So many of you who speak languages may not be aware of the fact that your languages are not being spoken as much as they were last generation, but most of our languages in the Northeast are slowly being spoken less and less at home. And we need to have these digital records to make sure that they're secure, okay, that we can teach them to our kids. To do language documentation, what does it take? To be a documentary linguist, what does it take? To be a documentary filmmaker, I need my camera, I need a crew, I need to have good, uh, you know, good ideas about how to make fancy like cutaways and music and you know, that's what you do when you're a documentary filmmaker. If you're a documentary linguist, what is it that you need to do? A lot of it is just stuff that you and I do already, for example, recording. Um, so how many of you record yourselves on your phones, like send messages through WhatsApp? People are smiling, but they're not putting their hands up. So I think many of you do probably. Uh, on your phone right now, you probably have videos of your friends doing funny things, or you singing a song, or something like that, right? 
Yeah, so you already are documenting things. Documentary linguists record natural interactions between people. Some of it can be storytelling, but a lot of it can be just talking with each other because if we want to keep records of the language, we want records of natural use. But we also want things like all of the traditional stories because they hold so much information in them for future generations that, that would be important. So we record uh, and we decide what to record. We can talk about that if you have some questions, what to record. Then we are very good with, we're, we are trying to make people aware of the fact that when you record a lot, you have a lot of files. Again, I would like to talk to you about your phones because we all have a phone. How many of you have a lot of photographs on your phone? Many, many photographs, right? <laughs> and a lot of times we have duplicates of the same thing. 50 pictures of me looking at something, you know, take it again, take it again. So we want good data management, but once we start recording, because it's so easy to record, we can have hundreds of recordings and we won't know how to use them unless we have information about them. So we need to have good file naming practices. This sounds so boring, right? But if you record well with very good equipment, placement, good lighting, just like the documentary filmmaker, and you do good practices with data management, the next step of being a documentary linguist becomes much easier. And so I think all of you, if we can teach you just those or find out what you're doing for data management and then make some suggestions, you could be documenters very easily of your family languages by recording and then doing that data management. The next step um, is really for a little bit advanced. So what I want to say is documentary linguistics or docu language documentation up to these first two points is really open for all of us to be involved in. And it's also open for all of your family to be involved in. Anybody can learn how to record well and manage their files well and then they can hand that over to the linguist who can then go on to the next steps here. So I really invite all of you to think about yourselves as language documenters and um, if you have, you know, want to talk more about how, we can, we can discuss how you can get into the next steps or you can incorporate or participate with linguists on the next steps. So recording data management, then the next step, like what I would do is I would listen to some of the things I've recorded and I would transcribe them. I would try to write them down. I would either write them down phonetically, like you've been teaching your students about the international phonetic alphabet, or if that is difficult, then I might also use the practical orthography, like what your Bibles are written in or your hymnals are written in. There may be some variation in the spelling. It may not be perfect. People may still not agree on how things need to be spelled, but you have some basic idea how to, how to spell it. So we might listen to what is being said and write it down. With those three things, you know, the recording, the data management, the file naming, and your transcription, you're ready to send something to an archive and have something that has your name on it as a published item, a digitally published item. But if you had uh, more of an interest, you could also go on to translating it and then providing some analysis of it. For making something data management, we also, data management is necessary. Data management here is really, re we've got data management in two places. The first place is file naming. Um, and I don't know if you look on your hard drives, what your file naming systems are like, how you've named your files. Uh, it may be, if you're like anybody else, it's probably kind of messy. Like first you name your files in one way, sometimes you add the date, sometimes you just say stuff I need to do, sometimes it says let me delete this later, or you know, you've got a whole number of, but if you're going to be doing this kind of work, you have to be very careful about naming your files, okay? So that's the first data management. The second data management has to do with saying who, what, which, where, when, how about the item that you collected, just like a good journalist. Like I collected grandpa telling a traditional story about a clever monkey and how he tricked an old man. When was it told? How old was grandpa? Do I have grandpa's name? What dialect or variety of the language does grandpa speak? Some basic information about the storyline. All of those things are necessary for good data management to know what that file is really about. Then we've got the archiving part um, and uh, then letting people know that it's there, disseminating that information. 
and then trying to then get together with other people to see how you can use or reuse that information. So let me, I think I actually have really squeezed in everything that I want to say in, in one slide and now I'm, I'm kind of portioning it out a little bit. Here's some of the kinds of equipment that we try to use. We really focus on the like, good microphones and storage. I think you've got, um, you've got some of, do you have some kits, some language documentation kits? So some of your students know about these things already. But I think that this is like the perfect uh, thing. Like we want really good microphones and good recorders and so on. But you could also, in a pinch, if you are at home, it's, a fest it's festival time and somebody starts singing, you could use your phone, you could use WhatsApp if somebody has a great idea about what, how a curry is made and you never realize that the pork had to be boiled in a certain way and this is, these are the herbs that you use. Don't feel shy about using your phone in those instances to get at least the initial or even it may be the only record. But the only thing is that when you're using your phone, there's certain things you want to check, like is it recording in WAV format and, and what is the format it's taking pictures in and so on. But your phone might be a good alternative if you have nothing else. So um, th these are some of the things that we look at and in terms of um, recording. Did you want me to say any, I, I think that this is good, this is good for this, yeah. Then we also use some other software that we've been talking about in our online course to take the recorded sound and then provide that tran transcription. You know, I was telling you that you might write it in IPA or you might write it in like uh, orthography. Well, it's very difficult if it's on your phone. Like, how am I going to do that with it on my phone? Do I have to like stop it and start it? You know, we, we don't have to do that anymore. Nowadays, uh, we have a lot of software that allows us to slow down the speech, hear little loops of speech, and, and uh, even in some cases, uh, there are things which, where you can run a program and have a certain amount of automatic transcription done. That if you're interested in doing some computational linguistic work or trying out some of those tools for automatic translation or uh, alignment, those would be fun to try on, on some of those. So for example, if we had a tool for Manipuri, how would it work on al Naga? Might, there might be some, some success. So this is what we use this, these tools for. These are free. In other words, there's no barrier between you and me and good transcription and translation because it's free. You put it on a PC. It doesn't work on a Mac, unfortunately, but you put it on a PC and off you go. Um, there are also good keyboards. So this is not important for you so much because I think most of our languages here in Nagaland, we use the Roman uh, script. So And we use some, some marks sometimes, an accent here and there. But the, the, probably something we can do with the regular keyboard. But if you're using Dave Nagari, this is very useful, for example. It can help you get the, the matras and everything and you know, just switch from English to the other keyboard easily. Um, there's, a, there's also software that helps you do subtitling. Samer also helps you do that. So if you're interested in creating a, let's imagine a story, a traditional story that you really like, and you want to create access to that story. You could use something like Samor and do the transcription, and then use um, the Samor files that export from Samor to do the subtitles. So, how many of you do YouTube, YouTube videos? Anybody make YouTube videos? See, I can see. I do get. I'm starting to get some hands going up. Yeah, who doesn't make a YouTube video? Even I have YouTube videos. But um, what you need to do with YouTube then, oftentimes, you want to give subtitles, and YouTube helps you do those subtitles. This is exactly the same technology. It provides you with an SRT file, so you can write like uh, the Naga. Uh, if you want to do Ao, you can have that, and then you can also underneath the English. So you can either have just the, the language in question or the English translation or both. So say more is really useful for that kind of dissemination as well. Um, then we also, this is like a little bit advanced, okay, so this will be for the next step. If you collect the story, then you will start an avalanche of research and an avalanche of good things for your communities because not only can you do the YouTube videos, with that and that disseminates like cultural knowledge and keeps it going and tells people, hey, pay attention, we have good stories, we have our heroes, we have our themes, just like you guys do in the West, right? We can do that with our stories. But you also help the linguists create dictionaries. 
which you can contribute, continue to contribute to. So there are, are tools that we're talking about in our class, uh, like a tool called Flex, F-L-E-X, also free, that allows you to take like a story that has been transcribed. So let's say it was like, long time ago there was a man, right? So if I type that into Flex, it can take the word man and put it in the dictionary. It'll take the word long time and put it in the dictionary. And I can gradually, each sentence, this program is starting to remember the words in your language. So at the end of 20 stories, all of a sudden I have this great lexicon or dictionary that I can use to show the kids, build picture books, um, build a better dictionary. So there's, there's a lot of usefulness in, in creating stories, collections. Uh, and then there's more that's, that people can do with their linguists. They can actually look at the structure of the language through those stories. Something that in India we really need to do and we haven't been doing, um, and I know the linguists here can contradict me or discuss with me, but I feel like we will not be better linguists and we will not understand our languages until we start doing more of this connected text. So you could be also the first people to help with that by, by collecting the stories. So this is what we've discussed so far, that language documentation um, is something that in the old days was something we did with pen and paper. We sat down and we would say, can you tell me a story in your language? And I would write down, I would record it maybe with the, you know, we had the old, I uh, have seen those old uh, cassette tapes. So I did all of my, my work in Manipur on cassette tapes. And, uh, and then I had an old recorder and I would play it and then I would put the pause button and I would write down what was said and I could play again. And we, many of us my age joke about how many tape recorders we've broken because we have to press the pause button over and over. Uh, none of that is necessary anymore. Technology has pushed our field forward so much. All we have to do is grab that technology and join the rest of the world in, in linguistic discovery. In addition to that, we can add all community members in this venture and all other academics. So if you're in history, political science, if you're in anthropology, if you're in literature studies, tribal studies, you can contribute to this venture by collecting the histories that you think are important, right? Not that what I want to collect as an outsider, but what do you, what does your family think is important that needs to be added to the record? And that needs to be a part of the lasting record and bring it up in this format of the recorded portion. Video is really good, but if you can't do video, do audio. Really uh, high fidelity recording is really good. If you can't, use your phone, but if you can do that much and do good file naming and good do basic metadata, who, what, which, where, when, how, then you can be part of this whole venture of making a lasting record. Um, and so that is, that is what, so far. The next step of this, though, there's one piece that we haven't discussed is once you do that, where does this stuff go? Where are we going to put it? And in the past, most of the time, it was sitting in, on a server in, the, in a linguistics department or English department or a hard drive. Like I've asked a lot of people as I've been traveling. I've been to, uh, I was telling director, Kokrajar, I went to Silchar, I went to uh, Manipur, I went to the Manipur, uh, uh, Manipur University of Culture, um, and I'm going to Central Institute of Indian Languages. Many of these places, when you ask people, so you're doing language documentation, that's fantastic, you're recording precious material, there are only 300 speakers left of Karam, that's great. Where is your material? And they say, on my phone. <laughs> or, <laughs> on a hard drive. Oh, I've got it all backed up on a thumb drive. But you and I know that, like, and actually, we, in, in Silcha, there were two gals who were so sad about it because they said, yeah, we had this great stuff, and, but one of them had a baby and the baby dropped the phone in the water and gone. <laughs> <laughs> and it's life and you cannot, I mean, it, it's almost like you're holding a precious artifact from Mesopotamia or something <laughs> and you're letting it, you know, sit on your coffee table so it can fall because this is precious stuff because our elders are, are going. In the Lankan community where I work in Chandel, uh, in, um, in Chandel, Man Manipur State, um, we lost so many elders to COVID. Uh, and this time when I was working with my young you know, consultant, Rex, 
every day we would say like, oh, I wish Swami was still here. He would know. You know, that meant that information is with Swami. And uh, we were going to bring Swami to the US to, to work on stuff and he's gone. So it's real, like we, our elders are going and the information is leaving. So we don't want to leave our stuff in hard drives. We don't want to leave them on pen drives. So I am encouraging, that's one of the reasons why we built Corsal too. I'm encouraging a very simple workflow. So I'd like to share that with you now, and I may repeat myself later on on another slide. But the workflow is you do the collection. Then you email us and say, I collected something. And it may be that you collect it in conjunction with your professors for a class. You know, that's very possible. Um, you may do it as a Tetso College signature, you know, capstone assignments that students are doing. Or you may do it as an individual. I mean, whichever way you do it, if you are passionate about it, all you have to do is email us. It's like Corsal UNT at Gmail or something of that sort. I can let you know about those details. And then, because I know our communities, what we've done is we've set up um, like a partner with one of my students. So we partner you with one of my students, and that student contacts you, depending on how often you want to be contacted, uh, and says, okay, we got, we, now let's talk about where your files are. Now let's talk about your file naming. Then she, my, my students right now are all female, so they, then she will help build your metadata or your who, what, which, where, when, how. And then she'll ask you about, what do you want to say about your collection? Uh, what do you want to call, you know, what, what is it, what do you want to call the language? What do you want to give description in your language and in English? So that's sort of setting up the, the portal to your collection. And that's it. That's really the process. And what we do then is we put all of that in queue for our other collections, and our digital librarian takes over. We have a fantastic uh, partnership with our digital library. They take over and then they do their archival thing. They create several different versions of the files. One of them goes into a deep archive. One of them is an MP3 working, like a, a smooshed file, like a compressed file. We hope that you can give us the WAV files so we can archive the WAV files and have the MP3 for streaming. They may help us trim files. They'll tell us if they're duplicates, all of those things that need to be done for an archive. And they'll put them in the archive and they'll contact us again. We go in and check, we put in the information, and we release it. So that process, what did you have to do in that process? Main thing was you had to do the recording and you had to send the email. And so we hope that we've simplified that process so that we can um, really get more and more of you interested in, in participating. Once the process is in, um, we're, we will, we will want to like build um, research projects on the basis of that, that may be specific to what linguists want to do. For example, uh, Dr. Vaiko and I were talking at lunch about doing a uh, reconstruction of the histories of sound change in, uh, with, for, for the uh, languages of Nagaland. In order to study how languages have changed, you know, they all, we believe they building, start from an, a common ancestor and then through natural sound change have diversified so that now you have several different languages we would be able to use the data that's there to then build a story about how, how languages have changed. So you start with the source data, you provide the basic analytic tools through all of you, then the linguists can take over and go. If we don't have the source data, we can't really ask the questions. This definition comes from the National Science Foundation. National Science Foundation is one of the biggest funders for language documentation work. And you'll notice that it says the National Science Foundation. A lot of times people don't, don't agree with or don't think of the fact that documentary linguistics is very much in the science realm as well as in the humanities realm. It's humanities because it's about our cultures and it's you know, anthropological study. It really is about our identity. It's all of those things that have to do with that kind of social science. But then it's also in information and computational science because of all the things I told you about how it has to go into the archive, there's database stuff involved, there's, there's um, possibility for future, future work. So it is in the science, National Science Foundation. And so you can read here why they're, they're funding it because not only in India but all over the world languages are dying out. And so they, they know that this is an irreplaceable treasure. And so not only for the communities, which is very, super important and I'd like to talk to you about that and actually ask you to also talk a little bit at this point. Okay, so 
it's very important for science, but it's also important for communities. How is it important for you? I'd like to ask you. Um, and so all of that untapped um, information about, uh, about culture and about language will disappear. And so this is why we are trying to, to document the language. And I mentioned that I've written this book, Why Language Documentation Matters, and that in this I discuss those, those questions. But what I wanted to discuss just very briefly with you and ask you about is in the first half of that book, I, I discussed how it's important for just social well-being. And I think a lot of times we don't, I don't know how many of you here are going to go into being anthropologists or sociologists, but there's one thing that could be studied, and that is how things improve when people are connected with their language and cultures. There's anecdotal evidence, and also some that they've done where they have statistical kind of backing of it, of where in Native American, for Native American groups who've been very much cut off from their languages and cultures because there was a lot, a lot at least one generation um, who would be probably like my age, they would be uh, in their 60s, maybe maybe 60s and 70s by now, but they were not allowed to teach their language, to speak their languages when they were in boarding schools. The, you know, the government put them in boarding schools. And so that filtered to the rest of the family life because they were so embarrassed about their languages that they never spoke them to their kids. So now people who are in their 50s, 40s, and 30s don't speak the language. But people who are 20 and 30 are saying like, no way, I want to speak my language. You can't tell me. So it's almost like this reverse identity thing. And they are saying, yes, my parents are completely messed up. My parents like, and there is a lot of, you know, that's my phone saying it's too big. <laughs> I keep thinking about turning off the some plane or something I needed to catch, so I had to put an alarm on. Um, so, so what, what uh, what's happening now is that kids are saying, "I want to re-engage with my culture," and they're doing it through language, and they're learning the language, they're learning cultural things like how to build a basket, how to make moccasins, how to go f hunting, through and hearing the language. And the studies are showing that kids who are in, engaged in that are doing much better in just life and in school. There was also a study done in Canada, um, which I also report in the book, I'm sorry, I forget the details of who was doing the study, but uh, where they discovered that in those communities where they were doing language and culture activities, they find a decrease in suicide rates, which had for some reason really skyrocketed among youth, and the, that had improved, and then also caused diabetes space which also shows Ill, Ill health, right, all around bad habits and so on, that those have decreased as well. So there, there, the, there is a, a real um, potential of if language and culture engagement happens, that it might be something that helps people find connections with their past and feel, have a sense of identity they can be proud of. So some of this work is really important, I think. So I wonder, like, uh, I, I've talked a lot, and I don't know if any of you will talk, but we can ask the question. Uh, I mean, do you feel like, uh, or, or let me ask the question like this, in your families, in your communities, are there some people who are already doing this kind of work, of working on languages? You know, some, some of you are saying no, not at all. Any of you have, like, an uh, uncle who has been recording people, or, any websites that have been created? Think of? No? No? Well, go out and investigate and see if, they, if you've missed it. Maybe it's there and you don't know. Um, maybe there, is there a literature society? Go out and find out if there's a literature society for your community. That, that there is. Okay. And do they produce books or what community are you? Not really, man. Actually, uh, they're into lexicography. And uh, what they're missing out there is <coughs> archiving them. So, uh, so it's just print. So I think that's where uh, maybe I'll trade myself here, and then maybe I'll tell them about it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so they're interested in this. So they're they're collecting things, and now they want to actually put them someplace safe that's and right. have you know have more visibility for them. Yeah. And what what community are you from? Uh, home. Okay. Home. Home. Okay. Great. So I, I think that it would be interesting. So if I uh, talk about Manipur, 
Uh, there are like 30 odd languages there. There's lots of literature societies and so many people have collected things and they don't even realize how much material they have. Like there was a, uh, we have a Com collection, K-O-M, and um, the, she came, oh, the Com professor came to one of my workshops there and she said, well, I have a few things and you know, my neighbors have some things and you know, I really think we should save them because it, after they started collecting them, there was more than a few things and there were collections of stories. We have a, a Com collection now. And you can see by the books that they're very old, and but they have there are there's written literature on home now available for the next generation to, to build on it. So look look under your parents' beds. <laughs> Maybe ask them first. <laughs> Is there an old uh, story book? Is there a genealogy? Is there a book of proverbs? Did somebody ever write anything about spelling? Do you know if there's a, an alternate hymnal? Um, has anybody revised the Bible? How, how many versions of the Bible do you have, mom and dad? Because all of those things will tell us something about the history of your language, and all of those things, the print things, are also worthwhile for for putting in um, our the, the archive. Um, so, so I think you know maybe I'll leave it at this that you can think about you know your own situation. Um, if you were to engage or if you are connected, how is that making a difference for you in your personal life? But it seems like it has for, for others. Then I just will point you, since many, some of you here are, in, you know, are interested in oral as, uh, literature as literature, the verbal art and poetics um, entry here. If you look at what they call discourse analysis or poetics or verbal art, I, I don't know how to put a percentage of it on it, but let's just put a wild thing like 70%. Most of what we know about that, most of the theorizing on that, comes from Western art, right? Western oral art, because that's what we know about. Uh, because we have not really published much about what we have here in the Northeast. Even if we have stuff in India, that's mostly, you know, maybe there are religious texts. We've got the, you know, we've got uh, kids' stories that are very popular that are known around the world. But those are from other languages, not from the Northeast Indian languages. There are different ways of thinking about life. There are different things that are important in terms of values and heroes and relationships in the Northeast that nobody knows about. And so people don't really understand the cultures here. So if you, you know, so this is for verbal art and poetics, this is an addition to that, which is, has to do with um, how, how a story is actually structured. So I'm just gonna give you two seconds of, a, of a, one minute of like a, of what I mean by that. Um, if you study, like I wrote a paper about a, a, a famous Manipuri story um, that, uh, and, and I was looking at the rhetorical structure of it. How is it actually put together? And what you find there is that when it's when you look at the episodic pieces, like going from one part of the story to the other, there are uh, places where things are paused. There are introductions of the same kinds of uh, words, like after that, at that time, once once that happened. Very very different from what you find in some other stories. Uh, some other kinds of stories are. That part is very similar. What's very different is how long the sentences are. Because the sentences really never end. You just say, you have a sentence, you say after that, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then you finally have an ending of a story. So the way the stories are structured are really dependent on the linguistic structure as well. And our, stru our languages here are very different. So you could really make a killing on your thesis if you were able to do something on this. All right, um, let me see. How much longer did you want? Are we kind of getting to a closing point? The funding. What was that? The, the second part. This. Oh, the funding part of it. OK. So um, if, you're, uh, if you're interested in, in more of this, like what are the discoveries that we can make with, uh, with more linguistic study, um, that I think I can pass my book around to you, and you can take a look at some of these other issues. And I will actually not look anymore at my PowerPoint, and I'm going to go to a nice slide right at the end here. Okay. All right. So um, for funding, I have a, yeah. Um, when you start planning a project, 
what you'll discover is that um, there actually are a lot of people, a lot of different types of groups that are interested in funding this work. Uh, some of them are interested from the science perspective, and some of them are interested from the humanistic perspective, and some of them from the folklore perspective. So the Firebird Anthropological um, Association is very interested in stories and story collections, and especially when collected by uh, people from the communities. So if you either are from the community or a partner from the community, or can create, if you can create a group of people um, and you're leading it, then, uh, then this would be something they would be very interested in doing. And they give out uh, smaller grants, but like $5,000 and $6,000, but that can go a long way in, in Northeast India. So we could develop quite a bit with the Firebird Foundation grants. Um, then there are, uh, there are private foundations that are either in the UK or in the US. Um, and the Endangered Language Fund is one. Nick Ulster's uh, one, I forgot to put that one down, but I forgot what it's called, but there's one additional one. I'll tell you about ELF. An Asian Language Fund, for example, right now has sp special monies for what they call legacy collections. So if there is a collection that, say, um, a professor who is working on your language has, then you could apply for money to help bring those things into an archive. So I, for example, when I started working, did not have Digital World uh, with me, so I have a lot of mess in some of the work that I did previously. I could hire a student to help bring that forward, and those are, uh, again, around four to five thousand, five thousand dollars. We got one of those to work on Kokoro and uh, Professor Matisov's Kokoro collection. So now there's some Kokoro on on the archive. Um, the the ELDP grants uh, the individual language documentation project grants, right, are from, um, not from SOAS anymore, they're from Bird. They're from Bird. And they are also private, they're from Arcadia Foundation. Um, and their goal is really to work with severely uh, endangered and underdocumented languages, but there are very many different types of funding categories there that you could apply for. These are all the ones that I know of that are available to people in India. Um, the National Science Foundation has, again, grants that are from you know, $100,000 to, to $450,000. I currently have three of those, and they're all for working on languages in Northeast India, and uh, one for Hakalai. Uh, so two for, two for here, and then one for Hakalai. But uh, the, the, these are available if you partner with somebody in the US. And so you have to have a US-based um, researcher. So what do you need to do to apply for funding and why do they care about this? Well, the, the funders would like to see a product at the end. They'd like to see, all of them require archiving. You have to know how to archive and you have to show that you have intent to archive and public access of those materials. That is the standard goal these days of science for, from psychology to linguistics and the funders are also asking for that. So if you have a link with an archive and you've got that workflow set, you have one foot in the door for saying, I know what I'm doing and I'm going to get that done. Um, what else are they looking for? They want to see that you're going to have, you have a clear vision and that you have the right team, that you're going to have the right team to really build that project. So I just put a few things together to think about, um, figure out, you know, who in the community, because you wanted to really, for ELDP and for NSF and ELF as well, Community involvement is very important. They don't want us to be academics who say, I'm going to work on such a listed language and just go in there and work on it. That's um, an old model that worked in the old days. But now we have technology has kind of leveled the playing field and everybody can be involved. So who in, who's working on the languages in the community? What is the most need that they find? Um, what already has been done? What needs to be added? And on the basis of these things, then figuring out how to put together a viable plan. And uh, I'll be more than happy to like talk about that in, in like excruciating detail because I also, I, I don't know if you knew that, but I ran the National Science Foundation for, 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 for about three years and then I've uh, been teaching this course uh, for the uh, Collaborative Language Institute. So, but, but I think the thing to, to know is that this is fundable work. And it is fundable from an institutional level. 
it's fundable for, for people who are individual professors, and it's fundable for teams of students working with, with a professor. And I think that that, that you know, uh, definitely for an Agaland, you can do something bigger, because you've got so much potential here. Was there anything else that we want to say about funding uh, in particular? Maybe those who are interested, they can meet you in person. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, if you're interested in this idea or um, any other, you're very welcome to meet with me. And uh, I, I think I would love for you to pull out your phones and um, you know Google Corsal.unt.edu and take a look at our website. And under archive, if you go to archive, you'll see the different collections that we have right now. And as I've been traveling the country, we've added up. I think. There are at least 10 more that will be coming into the dock um, from people who said, oh yeah, we've got stuff that we really need to do something with. Uh, so please uh, look at the website and um, I, will t I will close with just one uh, thing, if you'll allow me one second more. I want to tell you that Corsal is not, um, it's not like a, it's not a myth or something. It's really, a, a hush, I, I myself am really excited by the fact that we are bringing native speakers of languages to my university. So we already brought social Kular there from, Chan, uh, from Chandel. She did her master's, now she's doing her PhD. Drew Langpasa is there, he's a Dimasa speaker. He just started his MA after many fights with COVID, you know, not allowing him to get on the plane. He's finally doing his master's with us. Uh, we have my uh, my colleague Sadaf Munshi has brought several speakers of Burushavsky. We have speakers of a language called Mankiali. Um, next semester, I'm working on bringing Boro speaker of, and already professor of ling uh, doctorate of linguistics, Prof. Basumatari, there as our archivist in residence. He's going to be working on archiving his, the rest of his materials with us. He's coming as a visiting scholar. I'm hoping at, I just put the paperwork in to bring. Uh, Marjing Mayang Lumbum, who is a player of the Pena, and uh, to digitize all of the Pena recordings of his father, who's a professional Pena player, who holds that information from the VCR tapes and to create a, um, a record. So it, 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 it's a real thing, it's happening, and I would love for you guys to be involved in it, you know, in some way, because it's, it's a rolling, it's going. So, um, uh, yeah, so, so, um, be, come join Corsal in some, some way or the other, and thank you for your attention, thank you for your invitation, and I'm happy to take some questions now, or we can mingle and talk. Thank you. So we have, it, I think maybe we can have a quick Q&A session, if anyone wants to ask. Uh, Ma'am, in considering like recording or archiving uh, a story or any folk uh, lore I can say, uh, in one consideration, I mean, when I looked at that from uh, my uh, dialect point of view, I think uh, I have noticed that uh, the way the story starts, it's a very, um, I would say it's a little uh, phenomenologically a little different one because it's not once upon a time. Right. Uh, so, um, in our dialect, it, it, it is something like Kahtamka, which means since the beginning of time. Now, it's very questionable how do we like determine when the time, like the time frame was also even created, and it seems like the, the thought process and the whole lot of it. So, and now also considering uh, a place like Nagaland, which has like been Christianized all for quite long, now, Questioning the idea of the beginning of time becomes really, really controversial or sometimes even problematic. How do we go about it? Yeah, okay. it's really a good, good, good thought that you had here because I think for this process we're talking about right now, try to be as literal as possible. And knowing that there will be interpretation that has to come later. Because if you think about any li fine literature, for example, or if you even think about the Bible, Think about all of the interpretations that have been written of the Bible. We cannot be responsible for the final interpretation. What we're trying to say is we're responsible for just saying that there is something there to be interpreted. So, as you're saying, if it's talking about from time immemorial, or if it's to, 
you just would say exactly literally what the words are saying and you are free to say I as a speaker or I as a part of this community know that this could mean many different things but I'm just giving you the basic uh, literal translation of it letting the figurative come later because what has happened in Manipur is that a lot of people have decided not to you know they say oh it's too complicated there are too many meanings and so they haven't done a, a, some of the work with the oldest literature because it's sacred and they're afraid to make a mistake with it and I can totally understand that but we have to watch out for not doing it at all because we're afraid so if you're really afraid at least give a summary if you don't want to do word for word give a summary this story is about and that in, in itself will at least preserve it for later later study Madam, there are sometimes words which cannot be translated in right. English, right. Uh, which has to be used as it is. So if it has to be, like, you know, translated, it takes a sentence. Right. <laughs> How do we consider that? that? And that is fine. That is fine to do. So when you're doing translation, like, we're not trained in translation, and we're not expected to be, like, perfect, uh, you know, following some sort of translation theory work, but... Uh, and, and you can leave some of that to the linguist later on to actually decompose uh, something that might be an idiom or a proverb. That can happen later. But you can actually put brackets around it and say, this is a phrase that means this, or this is a word that means this phrase. And that's enough for that, uh, for that first pass of explanation. Because so many of those things are like sometimes, um, that they, that our languages in this region have something called elaborate expressions, where we have um, two forms. So if, instead of just saying uh, fruit, for example, we may say fruit, fruit. We don't mean lots of fruit, we're just, that phrase fruit happens to have fruit dash fruit. One is Thai, the other one is Thai, Thai, Thai. It just means fruit. Uh, but um, because of these elaborate expressions, we might get stuck and say, oh, I don't know what to do. We just, we just, do the basic um, fruit dash fruit and leave it at that and go on because this is more of a deeper lexicographical kind of someone else's problem at some point. Someone else's happy problem. Really happy. <laughs> also because a lot, of, uh, a lot of these languages, the Sanskrit written no work has been done, so this is just a starting point. Anybody else who will come later will be able to work on what we have created now. That way, the simpler one is, you'll do for now, right? Yes, and it, it, I'm actually not saying what the standard view is. So if you're doing a documenting in ELAR, for example, or any of the other language archives, they really would like you to have the transcription and um, at least the, what they call time-aligned transcription. So you take the sound file and you have a, you know, what each word means, for example, what each word sounds like transcribed. They would like at least that much. Um, but I think that for our population here, we have so many different types of depositors and so many different types of people who want to be in on the, the, the game here that we would lose that opportunity if we insisted on that. And so um, I would like to, to really open the door for the source files and some metadata to be in there and to let that be the first publication for those people as well. Maybe they'll be interested in doing the transcription later. But you could always train your next phonetics class. Here are 10 stories in POM, and we're going to now sit down and bring some speakers in and work with them to do the transcription. Stories in there, you're not going to do it. You're not going to be able to do it, so. I have one yes. question. What, what's your end goal uh, that you see for Corso or the relationship that you have? Yeah, it's like, uh, sooner or later I'll have to retire, so then what, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish before that? Uh, so my end goal is having a workflow set up, and th I'm talking very practically here, right? So having enough funding and, and, uh, and a workflow set up so that this process that we're talking about can just go on without any one person being there. And we're getting close to that stage now in terms of getting administration and so on. We need a staff position of somebody who's going to be a curator. We need you know, all of that. So setting up a, a machinery that can keep going. But my, my own personal research goal is to 
get enough material in a format in Coursera where we can ask higher level linguistic questions. So it's computationally there, transcribed well, and then I can compare against several languages and try to figure out why something works the way it does. Um, where are the differences and what are the, what are the similarities between those languages? So that would be that would be like a great use of an archive if we can make that happen. So I would like to try that. And we were talking about that for sounds, but you can extend that to also grammatical constructions other types. Oh, I, if I could add one more goal that we have, which is for all of you, you know, now we have this new mother tongue, you know, mother tongue importance that the Indian government has given. But if you talk to teachers, like we've been talking to the borough teachers, it's like, what materials are available? How are we going to do this? How are we going to teach in our mother tongue grades one to six or whatever it is they want to do? And so some of my students are looking into the uses, reuse of archival materials for teaching mother tongue. Uh, and what, how can we derive, and I had, you know, I was going to talk a little bit about that. How can we derive teaching materials from what's in the archive? If you put a story in there, that was going to be really good material for all sorts of teaching. Um, culture teaching, basic words, and all of that. But history also, you can intermingle then world history with the Naga worldview and, and so on. Uh, so I think that would be so good, because otherwise things sit in an archive they're never used. So I would love to have like a slate of students who are working on like pedagogical uses of, yeah, of archive material. Maybe we can clap. <laughs> So uh, I think I'll give a little yeah. time to our uh, director. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you, Professor Shawana, for flying all the way, for being here, and for all the work that you're doing, especially in the northeast uh, eastern region. Um, you know, on behalf of the college and the community over here, I, I'd say that uh, I think uh, your goals. The intentions that in which you started, and then uh, choosing Tetzel College also to be part of Corso is something that we're really uh, happy about. Something that we feel we take this responsibility seriously. And for us, uh, what we hope is that we can, whatever we started, this would just be the beginning, and it's something that we can build upon and probably try to take it forward. Because uh, our institution, it's a small one. Um, it's one that's growing. We have. Yes, young people, or we all just look young. <laughs> or, uh, but then, uh, ultimately, what, what we want is, of course, the same dream. I mean, we want to be self-sufficient in a way where we can try to help our society, to try to help our uh, community over here, because uh, we, you know, our end goal, basically, is to create a positive impact in the world by empowering people towards lifelong excellence. So I think, um, we want to build upon this relationship to try to see what we can do. We feel that there is an urgent need, especially to document our languages, and we see it integrating with every other department, not just the linguistics, uh, but it connects with all the other departments because uh, we also feel that languages carry uh, culture, and uh, there's so many things that are passed on about it, and it's just not present in our society. So uh, there is a fear uh, from our own side as well of what we see is that we're, we're scared of um, the way and how fast we're losing our culture, identity, our language, and also just the whole, um, um, co you know, the whole concept of, uh, you know, it, of, of learning and uh, the, whole, the whole thing that's, that's happening in our society, we're just quite, uh, I mean, we have a certain concern about it. So it was very refreshing to hear that you feel that young people are actually going back <laughs> and then going back and speaking their languages and things like that, you know, and then, and we just, I feel is also very true. 40s, 50s people are probably doing that. I, I think we're seeing that in our, in our own, you know, homes and societies right now. And you know, as an institution though, I think uh, we would like to try to uh, 
make sure we can do what we can to try to preserve it and further this goal. Uh, pe most people in our society are not even aware of what linguistics as a subject is. Um, I think uh, the students who are here right now, I see a few, you know, you have done a fantastic job just by picking this subject and you have the potential to probably unlock and probably you have the faculty and support here as well to make sure that you know you unlock your full potential to try to see all the opportunities in this and um, probably you would be you know you're expected to probably help your juniors as they come in but you're also in some way you're also torch bearers for this subject in not just this college but actually this entire state I'm not I hope I'm not putting too much pressure on the two of you I see sitting here <laughs> but uh, this is the same thing that we have told our faculty uh, when this course was started the thing is just that linguistics as a subject is still quite new in our society and you know the but the potential is enormous and I hope um, that this, the students who are sitting over here, you know, you look at this as an opportunity, maybe, who knows, you'll wind up at University of North Texas if you heard the examples, <laughs> or maybe some other thing, and I hope the teachers or even individual students, you also look at those funding opportunities because it's, it's not the, about the funding per se, but then it's about the impact that you can create and you know the, the history that you're leaving behind if, if you're able to create something like this and I think uh, based on um, the end goal of what Corsal is going to be and what uh, you know Tetsu College also wants to be I think uh, we all of us here need to work together and your own individual departments um, which may not be connected to linguistics right now can probably also find an area where there you know there are opportunities for collaboration so um, we, you know, we are very grateful. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, we hope to get to know you better later also as well. And I'd just like to thank you, uh, the, thank the Department of Linguistics for this collaboration, for organizing this program, and for handling everything so well. You know, I think uh, you have a very bright future, uh, and I think that this department can grow to become one of the strongest, not just in the college, but in the states. Good luck to all the students and to all the teachers. Thank you. So thank you, ma'am. I think for for the interesting um, talk. I think most of us will be new to this idea of even like with the documentation, apart from few who are in the course online. Uh, but I encourage like all of us as a colleagues to put heads together and think something, if there could be some collaborative project that could be done interdisciplinary towards uh, some documentation or something like that. And ma'am will be very happy to help and support even to get grant actually if we are clear with our vision and plans. And ma'am actually, yeah, I, uh, she is the director of National Science Foundation for t for three years, yeah. So she, she knows ins and out, up and down how things work inside. So, so we're very, very fortunate to collaborate with her. So as I said, it's, it's just a start. We we'll work together wherever we are as a team. And, uh, and also all the department, yeah, if we can come up something in this uh, coming weeks or year, I mean semester, that will be wonderful. And also uh, with the course that we're doing, we also plan to publish a special volume on oral narration that few of us are joining. So those who could not join, also you're welcome to jump in and see how we can work together. We will try to help each other as much as possible. But the idea is at least to come up with some oral narration as a special volume published by Corsa. So it will be solely from uh, from the Tetsu um, team, like a special volume. Which the idea is. We all have to work. <laughs> so only Dr. Emma and I we cannot do that. So we have to contribute the articles. We're ready to help and train you the skills how to use the software. And apart we can do as a team. Yeah, that I want to remind. Also I thank you, Director, uh, for always being supportive. And we we're always inspired by your 
very far vision that you have <laughs> for us. Yeah, so uh, with that, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Hema for the vote of thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe she has another way to thank everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't have anything <laughs> else to add to the profuse gratitude that has already showered. <laughs> but yeah, I just have maybe I'll just say one thing, which is in this time when technology has steeped all our lives, we are all drowned in technology. All like our virtual lives are equally, if not more important than our real lives in this in this time. At this time, to, to bring in technology to do something so useful to the communities, to the world, to the field of academics, to the field of knowledge. I think that's a very important thing. And so, uh, I thank Professor Shobhana for bringing this into the midst of all of us and for introducing this to uh, everybody present here and uh, for offering all the help that she has already offered and, and that she has already also promised. Um, and I thank the director for his constant and consistent support and encouragement. I thank all the audience present here for your uh, patience and for showing interest in this. And uh, yeah, I also thank all the other uh, staff and uh, media, uh, IT department, maintenance, all of them who have made this event possible today. Thank you.